All righty, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so my presentation today is uh, really looking at some of what is coming um, in the new or in the draft MS4 um, permit, which public comment for that, I believe, ended um, it was sometime in September. Um, I haven't heard any news as far as, um, you know, what the, the details of those public comments were. Um, so uh, let's get going. So um, one of the biggest, uh, one of the sort of biggest overall changes to the uh, new MS4 permit is um, EPA's incorporation of uh, TMDL, uh, Total Maximum Daily Load, um, uh, requirements that are tied to uh, performance standards um, in each of the individual minimum control measures. Um, uh, so, illicit discharge, construction site, education outreach, involvement, all of those across the board are uh, being tied into these, these TMDLs. And so we're, SWAG and SWIC have felt, you know, it's a good idea to kind of get out ahead of this, um, present some information to our membership as to what those are, what they entail, um, any resources that might be available um, to help everyone out um, in, um, in, in meeting those those potential new standards. Um, so as I as I mentioned, a TMDL is an acronym, and uh, unfortunately, there will be probably quite a few acronyms thrown around in this presentation. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, it total maximum daily load. Um, it is a regulatory term uh, from the Clean Water Act, um, from Section 303D of the CWA specifically. And it, it's a document, it's a plan that describes uh, how you can uh, restore impaired waters. Um, and it identifies the maximum amount of a pollutant uh, a body of water can receive while still meeting water quality standards. Uh, the CWA states that uh, to develop a TMDL for each, uh, states are required to develop a TMDL for each body of water on the state's blue waters list. Um, you'll hear this reference to as uh, the 303D list. Um, in Ohio, it's presented in what they call the integrated report. Um, it does not give EPA additional regulatory, uh, regulatory authority over non-point sources of pollution. And it contains reasonable assurances um, load, re load reductions can be accomplished. Um, this slide here is just taken from um, Ohio P EPA's uh, guide to uh, TMDLs. It, it kind of outlines a little bit of the process. Um, so if for some reason a water, a water uh, watershed uh, stream, something like that, is considered to be, de uh, is determined to be impaired. It is then added to that 303D list, um, which begins uh, a fairly lengthy process of measuring water quality, collecting um, data, and, uh, you know, assessing a baseline, and then developing a strategy, implementing the strategy, and then eventually adopting it. Um, this next infographic uh, is just sort of another way of, of visualizing the process um, that helps you out a little bit. So um, that's sort of a, you know, 30,000 feet view of, of, of kind of what a TMDL is, and we'll get more into the nuts and bolts of that a little bit later. Um, but right now I want to look at, you know, the specific parts of the permit that, that really speak to TMDLs and um, you know how those are incorporated. Um, 
And the reason for this is because the current MS4 permit, small MS4 general permit, expired September 10th, 2019. Uh, the new small MS4 general permit um, is currently in the drafting phases, public comment, uh, and there was a hearing, I believe, September 1st. Um, and just for reference, the new draft mentions TMDL 59 times, whereas the old one mentioned it five times. So um, obviously that is a huge increase and it's going to be becoming much more important for uh, MS4 managers. Um, you know, I do want to add a few caveats to this. Uh, you know, we're looking at, um, this is a draft, it's not the final permit. Uh, you know, we don't know the nature or results of the public comments, and, you know, we don't know the disposition of Ohio EPA at this point with regard to those comments. So we're working with, you know, a few hypothetical here's, uh, hy hypotheticals here. Um, so just knowing that moving forward, um, you know, not to panic too much. <laughs> um, and I just had a, have a slide here, you know, I'm kind of kind of look at it in, in two different um, aspects. Uh, I'm going to start off with the program management side. Um, so the permit requirements in general, sort of uh, part one, um, how it will affect or incorporate your stormwater management program and plan, uh, which is part 3A. And, and then we'll move into looking at the individual uh, minimum control measures and how they're affected. Uh, which is part 3B of the permit. So program management. Um, so there's going to be a lot of text here because we're talking about a regulatory document and unfortunately there aren't a lot of pictures. Um, you know, part 1B, uh, basically, um, you know, um, so in order to meet, so they're basically setting up uh, this new permit, uh, basically in order to meet those TMDL requirements and uh, or the 2012 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement Annex 4. I, I'm not an expert on that, so um, so it's it's sort of being uh, added to the the overall intent of the pur and purpose of this new permit is to begin to find a way to um, meet and reach those um, those goals outlined in, T in the TMDL reports. This is another, another area of it. So, um, you know, essentially if um, for whatever reason, um, you know, TMDL requirements cannot be incorporated into certain parts of uh, a plan or something that would conditionally apply. Um, you know, you would be required to uh, file for a, um, an individual permit. So basically what it means, you know, just sort of summar summarizing it here is that the TMDL requirements are becoming holistically part um, of the the MS4 permit, and um, and it's it's becoming a much b bigger part of what we do as MS4 managers. Um, for the stormwater ma management program, not a whole lot changed there with regard to TMDL implementation because Part 31A, which had no changes, uh, states that you should develop and implement a stormwater management program um, that does make reference. To, um, I believe that might be the next slide, um, uh, applicable TMDL recommendations. So um, really, um, you should have been doing this already. Um, you know, if you aren't, you're required to submit a new SWAMP SWMP um, within 180 days of the permit renewal, so you'd be forced to incorporate them anyway. And um, the BMPs outlined in the swamp have to be um, tailored to target uh, pollutants referenced in the TMDL report. So that's kind of my summary there. Um, the individual MCMs, um, just some umbrella considerations, you know, before we dive into this. 
Um, it's, it, all of the TMDL references are uh, tied to performance standard, which is how we are graded as MS4s um, as to whether we are successfully or unsuccessfully in implementing that particular control measure. Um, one of the big changes as well that's coming to the report um, is um, requirements for SALT. Um, those are not tied to any TMDLs, at least as far as I'm aware of, and they are not listed as pollutants that's concerned. Um, all TMDL references, um, it will affect how you report things um, and how you compose and what you keep track of. So that's a consideration as well. Um, all the TMDL references do begin with the word if. So if you are the lucky soul that has an MS4 that um, does not discharge to a watershed with a US EPA approved TMDL, um, those particular sections would not apply to you. And again, this is a draft. Um, if, these, if these portions of the permit, um, they could or could not make it to the final version. So starting off with MCM1, uh, public education and outreach. Uh, basically, these are just quoted sections. The MS4 uh, with a TMDL performance standard, uh, you may be required to implement additional themes or messages. Uh, public education and outreach shall include at least two stormwater themes or messages targeting each TMDL pollutant, uh, which can get interesting as we'll uh, see in the, in the latter portions where we dive into a TMDL report a little bit. Um, and um, so, yeah, so you're, you're required to, you know, if you were to have um, a TMDL uh, for uh, nutrients, so phosphorus, nitrates, nitrites, you might potentially have to uh, tailor an, out an outreach and an education program to, for instance, um, you know, lawn fertilizer application, something of that sort. And these might be things you're already doing um, as part of your education and outreach. It would just be, you would have to make sure that, you know, you know, everything works up and is reported accordingly. Um, summary slide there. Uh, education or uh, outreach involvement and participation. Uh, very similar to what's coming down for education and outreach. Um, if you have a TMDL performance standard, you might be required to implement more um, than just the minimum uh, outlined. And you are required to have at least two public involvement participation activities targeting each TMDL pollutant identified for your small MS4. Um, that one might be a little hard um, just because you know, the nature of them and involvement activities. Um, you know, you might have to have uh, maybe a public forum or something like that, a town hall discussing sediment, and you might have maybe five people that show up to it. So that one seems to me a little bit um, of a tougher nut to crack um, with regard to uh, some of the MCM2 requirements. Um, so you have to implement additional uh, involvement and participation activities, um, at least two activities uh, requiring uh, are required to target each TMDL pollutant, and um, you must identify each activity uh, for each TMDL pollutant. Um, MCM3, illicit discharge detection elimination. Um, you know, if your small MS4 discharges to a watershed with a US EPA uh, approved TMDL, here they're getting a little more specific um, nutrients, so phosphorus, nitrates, nitrites, those sorts of things, E. coli, uh, overall general bacteria or dissolved oxygen, you are required to um, include an annual employee training, uh, which includes IDDE topics, and uh, include water testing water quality testing and monitoring um, of uh, dry weather flows uh, to prioritize concern. Um, so really there, you, you have to develop a training program. 
um, uh, which covers IDDE and test and sample dry weather flows, which um, it, it you know there's it's not very specific as to as far as what EPA means when they mean when they say test or sample. Um, and I and I think you know a lot of people are a little nervous about this, but I think um, you know some of what I've heard is that um, it can be fairly straightforward sampling with test strips and things of that nature. So, uh, you know, we'll look to EPA for some guidance there. Um, construction site stormwater runoff control, MCM4, um, is specifically uh, tied to uh, the inspection, its inspection components of it. It's primarily to do with TSS, so sediment siltation, and uh, nutrients. And if you are in a, if you do operate in a TMDL or a watershed with a TMDL that has uh, those listed as pollutants is a concern, um, you are required to increase your inspection frequency uh, to every 14 calendar days instead of 30. Um, and it lists uh, the impairments that um, if the if the MS4 is seeing these impairments. Um, you are required to incre increase your inspection frequency. So construction activities that have started with no site or uh, with uh, no site plan approval, uh, failure to install sediment basin within the proper time frame, uh, failure to implement any sediment erosion controls, um, and dewatering activities result in, in turbid discharges. So, um, you know, the, the big takeaway for construction is that, um, you know, you might have to increase your inspection frequency and you can return uh, to the 30-day interval if um, the compliance issues are addressed and verified. Um, Post-construction, uh, similar to construction, mainly applies to uh, watersheds with EPA TMDLs uh, for total suspended uh, solids and nutrients. Um, if you uh, if the post-construction BMP is in a watershed with those impairments, um, you're required to, uh, across the board, do educational and outreach opportunities to contractors and SWIP designers um, that um, basically address Table 4B practices and or other green infrastructure practices. Or you're required to retrofit Fit a, uh, retrofit an existing peak discharge stormwater practice, so a detention basin uh, to meet water quality requirements for its catchment area, uh, perform restoration of a channel I stream, uh, so stream restoration, or um, update your local requirements to require green infrastructure. So um, some of those could be pretty interesting um, in practice. Uh, from what I was able to read, it doesn't seem like it's affecting the operations and maintenance plan requirements. Um, there was no sort of changes or alterations or red lines there stating that, you know, the O&M uh, would have to be tailored uh, to a specific um, TMDL. But um, I would think as a plan reviewer, it, would be incumbent upon me to make sure that you know what's being installed in the watershed is going to help us meet those those load allocations uh, over time. Pollution prevention, good housekeeping for municipal operations. This uh, so basically any of these uh, pollutants of concerns, metals, bacteria, E. coli, nutrients, pretty much everything. Uh, you have to do. Um, one of the following, and, and these again seem like things that um, a lot of MS4s are kind of already doing. Um, you know, a street sweeping program, uh, catch basin cleaning program, uh, leaf collection or yard waste collection program. Um, again, these might be things that you're you're already doing as part of your municipal operations or, or your county township operations. Um, so it might just be more uh, of an issue of making sure that it's being tied back into the, the SWMP, um, being uh, addressed properly in the annual report, and, um, you know, just making sure that everything is kind of flowing as it should be flowing. 
So, you know, all of these changes, these big changes that might be coming with TMDLs, um, you know, where do you find information? How do you find out if, you know, your watershed or sheds, um, you know, even have an approved TMDL? You know, where do I even begin to start to look at some of these things? And uh, we, we have uh, a few tools available to us already. Uh, we did some work uh, with this. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Kari had set up some things via the TMACOB website. Um, there are some excellent resources available with Ohio EPA. Um, you know, the general TMDL program website is, is extremely helpful. So um, there we go. The link is going to work. So this is uh, the water quality assessment uh, unit summaries uh, for 2020. And, uh, you know, it's a web-based mapping application. Um, it has a lot of uh, the information you need to start to sort of peel back the layers of the onion uh, to find out, you know, the, the overall health of your watershed, it's, uh, whether it's, it's meeting requirements and, and those sorts of things. So um, there are so many windows open on this screen. So, um, so I'll just, you know, kind of zoom in here to, to one of our watersheds. The dots are the, the aquatic life monitoring points, um, the, the Lake Erie assessment units, large river assessment units here. And um, you start by just kind of clicking a watershed. And uh, there you go. There's a there's a link to the TMDL report right there. Um, so this is you know all of the Maumee River watersheds uh, individually named. So uh, the one example I have for you guys today that I'll be using in my presentation uh, is one that affects probably 90% of our MS4 area, if not all of it, um, is the Maumee, uh, the Lower Maumee and Lake Erie uh, frontal tributaries. So um, you go to that and you, you click the final TMDL report and there you go. Um, so there you go, that, that's an incredibly useful tool. Um, so, you know, as I said, we'll, we'll take a look at kind of what these are, where you can find the information you need and, and how to tie into it. Um, it's, it's a long document, it's a couple hundred pages, there's a lot of text and it's Pretty useful and neat, uh, incorporates a lot of analysis. Uh, but a lot of the information, the meat and potatoes of what you need to update your documentation, so your program, making sure your BMPs are, uh, are uh, properly positioned, um, is in tabular format. And it's just kind of going through it, getting to know it a little bit, and knowing where to look for these particular items. So, you know, here um, on the left, um, on this one side, we have, you know, the list of impairments uh, by watershed, by huck, and then that's just the continuation of the table. So we can find our pollutants of concern. Uh, you can find out what actually uh, those waste load allocations are uh, without some pretty thoroughgoing analysis. You know, it might not be necessarily meaningful, but you can get an idea of, of sort of what's expected here. Uh, the total phosphorus table, you can see the, you know, Wood County and others MS4, um, and it lists sort of what those waste load allocations are. Uh, this smaller table here we have, similar for uh, total suspended solids in Grassy Creek, um, so that helps out a little bit. Uh, again, just another sort of tabular breakdown uh, of those waste load allocations by the permittee, so say Rossford, Lucas County, and others. Uh, you know, they don't really have anything in this particular watershed, but um, just somewhat of the methodology of how they determined and allocated uh, particular areas and things uh, for municipal separate storm sewer systems. Um, and then here's a, here's sort of the, the summary of everything. So these are kind of the, the pollutant uh, reduction expectations and requirements that are outlined in the approved TMDL. So, uh, for instance, uh, on the smaller table here, we have Grassy Creek. Uh, you know, 
basically in order to meet the requirements, it, it needs a, for instance, 86 to 99 percent reduction uh, of E. coli, um, and it's telling you in the in the far column. Uh, you know, it's coming, the sources of the impairment are, you know, urban runoff and channelization. So that sort of ties back into, uh, you know, channelization, goes back to the good housekeeping or the, the post-construction requirements, which, you know, require you to retrofit a channelized stream. Um, urban runoff could be, it's kind of an all-encompassing thing. It could be, um, you know, it could be, discharges from construction sites. It could be uh, if you're in a more outlying area, for instance, we have some areas of the Grassy Creek watershed which are more outlying. Um, you know, for instance, the E. coli coming from urban runoff could come from uh, failing septic systems or it could come from, uh, you know, sewer breaks or problems there. So um, it gives you a little bit of an idea of, you know, where to start to look for these things, sort of areas that you would need to, um, uh, you know, areas that you as the MS4 manager would need uh, in, in, in updating your storm monitor management program to properly assess those, those requirements. Um, this is getting into a little bit more of the meat and potatoes. This is actual uh, recommendations, um, you know, based on the water, uh, based on the watershed and based on the um, uh, source of pollution and the actual pollutant of concern as well. So uh, for instance, in Crane Creek, if you look at channelization, um, it'd be the second one down under Crane Creek, you know, you can see, you know, the restoration categories are, are pretty much laid out for you. So your education and outreach, um, ag best management practices, that'd be more of a soil and water conservation district thing, but uh, storm water best management practices. Um, and then regulatory point source controls. Um, so it's it's really telling you, you know, what how to meet these sort of expanded areas um, in in this latest draft of the permit. So um, it's it's a great tool to to sort of dive into and in you know if you sit down when you're when you're planning your revision of your stormwater management program. Uh, to really read through these documents and uh, you know get a get a feel for for what the the TMDL report is telling you. Um, here it's getting even a little more um, specific, uh, you know, for stormwater management best practices based on the particular watershed. So you know, planning, you know, going to you know implementing uh, erosion controls on uh, construction sites, you know, re uh, reducing pollutants through treatment or reducing treatment uh, pollutants through flow and volume management. So that would, you know, that could potentially affect, um, you know, local ordinances with regard to peak discharge control and those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, it's it's really telling you, and it's it, it's getting somewhat specific as to, you know, what the the regulated MS4 can do to, uh, to to sort of meet these TMDL requirements. So, um, you know, as I said, um, you know, it's going to be potentially becoming very important to MS4 managers to familiarize their, themselves with TMDLs. And you know, there are a lot of resources out there um, to to begin to, you know, address a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, I can go back to the slide, and, and this is just a few things that, uh, you know, a few resources that I was able to pull together somewhat quickly. Um, this, you know, this slide here, somewhat quickly um, in preparing this presentation. So, um, you know, the, the help is out there, and obviously the assistance of TMACOG is available. I'm sure EPA would be more than happy to help out with these sorts of things. So, um, and in in writing this presentation, um, I did concentrate a little bit more on the TMDL changes. Um, I unfortunately had to put this together fairly quickly. My family was required to quarantine for COVID um, for the past week and a half up until Tuesday. So. Uh, 
Uh, I apologize if I'm sort of going through this a little quickly. Um, but the other major changes, um, there's quite a bit um, that is coming down the line with regards to SALT um, in the MCM3 sections, I believe. Um, you know, it is essentially requiring the MS4 to uh, begin to get a bead on, you know, salt storage facilities uh, that are in their uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so at commercial sites, um, you know, other, you know, other potential municipalities, those sorts of things. So um, salt is actually becoming uh, kind of a, a, a a bigger issue uh, for MS4 managers as well. So, um, so yeah, the, that said, I did not have a contact. I did not add my contact information, um, but I, I think from well, we have quite a few more people on. I just sort of got on and started talking. So, um, so you know, if if, if you guys have any questions. Um, anything like that, please feel free to uh, reach out to me, reach out to Team ACOG, um, and we'd be more than happy to help you guys. Thank you. Hey, Kevin, this is Joy. Um, could you send me your yes. presentation? Um, that might be something that Kari would like to distribute to the group. Yep, I can do that. Thank you. Any any questions? Hey Kevin, this Comment? is one. Um, I would yes. like to I would like to point out that there is an appendix A on the draft permit that breaks down. Yes, I missed that. Uh, sorry. So yeah, no, you're fine. <laughs> which which um which MS4, which watershed in that MS4, uh, the table does list, and for that watershed, um, it will say what pollutants there's a TMDL for. So if you go to Appendix mm -hmm. A, you know if there's no TMDL listed for your facility uh, in one of your watersheds, um, then you don't need to worry about the TMDL specific performance standards in the permit. Um, but that, you know, I would still encourage people, you know, especially if you have a TMDL uh, in, the, in that table A, it'll say, you know, maybe Ottawa River, maybe Swan Creek, maybe you have a TSS uh, TMDL. Um, and if that's true, then the permit would say you're going to need to do a public education uh, measure that talks about TSS or targets TSS. And so it might be helpful to still go to these, um, these fact sheets and say, well, hey, in that watershed, what was the source or the primary sources of the TSS? And maybe we should, we should tailor our messaging to those sources. But some of the legwork um, is already done in that Appendix A as to, you know, I am City of Toledo in these watersheds. This is where I have a TMDL, and these are the pollutants the TMDL addresses. That's it. Thank you, Lynette. So, um, there are no further questions. Uh, we can move on to the uh, to our next presentation, um, which is Andy Stepnick of the City of Toledo, um, and it's an example of a post-construction O&M plan and covenant. All right. Hi, everybody. And I know we have some attendees who came in around the 130 mark. So maybe we'll come back to the other um, actions on the agenda, Kevin. Yeah. Um, yep, yep. I, I, I just noticed that. 
we're up to 11 for the quorum What's that, and we, Joy? we're up to 11 for the quorum and um we need 14. okay so we're we to all day Sorry, it's Sarah. I'm I'm jumping into. <laughs> uh, we do have two callers. Um, if you called in more recently on the phone, could you just say your name, please? Ken Booker, my club of township. Yep, I have him. Okay, and there should be one more. I think Rob that's Nash. Rob Nash, I have you. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's that's still eleven. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. I need control to share my screen. Yep, Andy, I'll make you a presenter. How's that look? Looks good. All right, so post-construction O&M plans. We already know a lot about reviewing post-construction uh, best practices. And O&M would be for operations and maintenance. This refers to things that uh, come up after the pond is built, or I should say, after the control is built or put in the ground or installed. And so we're thinking months after the site is complete, years after the site is complete, decades after the site is complete. Um, so the first line here, we see that in our checklist for what a SWIP should include, um, they use the phrase long-term maintenance plan. So interchangeable terms there, but we a long-term maintenance plan. Um, and this is the list of what's supposed to be in the plan. Um, you see, uh, if you're familiar with the SWIP checklist, if you're receiving those from the site developers teams, then you may have seen this section and it's uh, kind of a subsection of itself here um, that I've taken a screenshot of. Um, so what we're gonna do is focus on this. Uh, my presentation, my last presentation in the spring or early summer focused on the plan itself um, today, I'm going to start by focusing on this piece of it. Um, in my case, I explain when I ask for this to be completed, when I bring intention to this section of the checklist, uh, when I bring it to the attention of you know, my point of contact for a site development, I say, I'm going to provide you with four here, item four. Uh, you're going to provide the rest as a standalone piece. And my number four is going to go at the front end of it. And we call that the front end language. And everything that you're going to provide me is going to go in as an exhibit to it. Um, when we talk about an agreement, a, le a legally binding agreement, um, the word covenant started coming up. You know, we started working with our law department to come up with a template for what this agreement was going to be. And then everybody started talking about covenants. I said, why can't we just say agreement? That's what the checklist says is agreement. And uh, an agreement is good enough for me. I don't know why we have to talk about a covenant now. Um, so um, I settled it for myself and stopped making it an issue because I did the millennial thing and Googled it. 
And uh, you'll see here, the first definition is that it's an agreement. Uh, when you talk about agreement, that's the way people talk. When you are talking with a lawyer or paying lawyers rates or charging lawyers rates, you use the word covenant. Um, what's a covenant? It has legalese in it um, and it's agreement language uh, in lawyer speak and it's in a format that's going to be acceptable for recording. Um, the recorder its office um, records legal agreements. This is from their website. Um, so when your legal language is acceptable for recording, then it can go and be filed at the recorder's office. Now, I don't know how many of you have used the recorder's website, um, but I bet a lot more of you have used the area's website as the auditor's information. Um, right now, the auditor and the recorder are working together to share information better. And I'll show you an example here. So this is from the auditor's website. This is going to be the property that we look at here shortly. And this is showing um, a, a list of recorded information that pertains to this parcel. Um, this first number under the arrow is purple. That's because I've clicked on it. It's a hyperlink. Below that, the newer ones that are all <clears throat> dated 2020. Uh, they're all blue because those are also hyperlinks. Below that, the ones that are dated 2003 and 1997, they don't have a hyperlink on it. We'll go back to that hyperlink before I'm done with the presentation. Um, you can see here that the first one is described on the right-hand side as a restrictive covenant. So we already talked about covenant and it's restrictive because it basically says that you're restricted to, if you own this property, you have to abide by the fact that there's a stormwater system there. So it restricts you from like digging it out or building a building where there's a pond. Um, and here's the number that's going to correspond with uh, what we're going to on look at here shortly. Um, here's an earlier one that I did last year. And I, while I was researching for this presentation, I noticed that this last example I gave you was under the transfers part of the auditor's website. The one from last year, they had it under remarks and splits. So this was for McDonald's. Um, but they still have at least a note there. It's real easy to find and will definitely show up in a title search. Um, so I'm going to follow up with my contact at the recorder's office and the auditor's office to see, kind of uh, get an idea of which way or why, why there's a difference between these two. Maybe it's just because they're getting up and running with sharing information between the two systems. And they'll say, oh, it's going to be the other one of these two routes from here on out. Or if they're different because of X, Y, and Z. Anywho, once it's available to show up in title search, uh, the instructions are in the glove box. And you're not going back to the rolled up, folded up drawings shoved in a file cabinet somewhere. And telling people oh, you have to maintain this because I have a file folder in my office that says so. Oh, what, you're the new owner? Oh, well, it, you still have to do it. Instead, they're buying the used car with the instructions already in the glove box. 
Now let's go back to this. What needs to be on it? Um, there's a section to the right of the screenshot that uh, as a reviewer of this checklist, you know, it has a yes, no, not applicable, and a place for comments. So what I'm going to focus on, again, to double up on uh, what I talked about last time is that you could have it checked yes, and then when you are steering the conversation with your development team, let's say, well, why can you check yes? Because there's it's not attached. They go, oh, well, the, I sent you the construction drawings. And so this becomes an important part of the conversation. Let's look at what this says. It says construction drawings or excerpt. Um, and so to the first time a designer is submitting this to you, they say, well, I sent the construction drawings, so that should be fine. Problem is it's hard to, or you can't put that in the glove box, at least as far as I know. Um, it doesn't work to record the construction drawings. For one, they're huge. And um, um, they're just unacceptable, they're unsuitable for recording. And when they send it back to you and say, okay, it's in eight and a half by 11 format now, then you have, then you have to say again, you can't shrink down your construction drawings to letter size, that's not gonna work. And you can explain, as uh, you'll be doing a lot of squinting. All right, so this is kind of what I think is a good idea for having something you can pull out of the glove box to operate and maintain your investment. All right, so let's take a look at this. Somebody's going to need to turn on the microphone and tell me if I succeed at switching to showing you the internet now. So we're going to go on to the recorders and auditors website. Sarah, can you tell me if I succeed here? Do you see the recorders website? Yes. Okay, thanks. So that first one, the one from 2019, that that uh, did not have a hyperlink associated with it. It was on the remarks and comments uh, part of the auditor's website. I typed that number into my clipboard and I'm gonna paste it into the recorder's website here. I'm gonna go under instrument and type this in as the identifying number. I'm gonna paste it in, control V is what I just did into this box here. And uh, I did a little uh, practice with my show and tell while Kevin was talking. And so I know that I can click on this, and it pulls up this here. And if I hit view image, um, it's on the right hand side. I think it's loading. I hope. Okay, hold on. Bear with me. Okay, here we go. So here's the front end language. So we've got a document viewer now through the recorder's website. And this is all public access. I didn't need any fancy login or anything like this. So if you need to show an example to other people that you're communicating with of what you're looking for, you can even, and they say, well, do you have an example? And you can say, well, go look on the recorder's website if you want to. That's one option you could give them. And you could give them certain properties to look at. Um, so here's the front end language. It says that you're gonna, not going to build a building where there's a pond and that you're going to um, operate the storm system. Pretty much what you expect anyway. But it says things in the city of Toledo's case, like you'll look at this according to the schedule and you'll send us a note annually that you've done it. Um, so here we go. They signed that they're gonna do it. Exhibit A, 
I don't have to check because the recorder and the auditor actually get together with the right people and confirm that the legal description works for them. Um, but in this case, they kind of blended the legal description with the uh, site map. It's not the best example. Um, but this is a McDonald's. It's it was less than an acre, but in the city of Toledo, we require uh, there to be stormwater um, treatment on sites less than an acre. And um, they're actually just putting in an extra um, um, uh, a second lane for their drive through. But they're part of a giant plaza that has a Target and a Kroger, and there was a pond in the back of it that went to a creek. And I said, well, can you get with the uh, owner of the plat and see if you can, it was an old pond that just had quantity on it. And I said, well, you gotta do something so you could retrofit the pond. Um, and they said they didn't wanna do that. And they settled on putting in um, inlet filters in their inlets, uh, which is good if you can imagine a McDonald's in Toledo tends to have the occasional piece of trash in the parking lot. So uh, that's good. So they got uh, inlet filters permanently on all these catch basins and uh, their maintenance plan that follows is that basically it's just per the manufacturer says you got to take a look at these bags. These have overflows on them, by the way. So even if they did fill up with trash, the water would still overflow and go down the drain without causing the parking lot to back up. Um, so it says clean out the bag if it's dirty. And if the bag tears, replace it with a new bag. That's basically all this one is uh, saying. Um, now let's go to the auditor's website. I have the tab preloaded that has this hyperlink here that's purple that you'll recognize from my presentation. I click on this, it's gonna hyperlink me to the recorder's website. And I did a dry run of my show and tell and I found out if I click on this hyperlink here, it pulls up the document viewer again. And this has the very similar front end language. Um, says basically the same stuff. And then when I get to they had an out-of-state notary thing here. Um, I don't have to worry about that. They're, they take care of that. Then their exhibit A here was more standard, uh, uh, the way I want to see it, where it just gives the legal description and nothing else. Um, and then exhibit B is the meat and potatoes here of what I look at. So this has the view of what's under the hood here. Um, and so it's a little bit grainy, but what you're looking at here is an underground system. You can see it's got an inlet manifold. It's got a hydrodynamic separator that's called out here. Um, it's got a big field of underground storage here. Here's Sylvania Avenue and Monroe Street. They even call, you know, <laughs> Here's how you pop the hood. You drive into this driveway here. Uh, there's catch basin, grass, to help you get oriented. And then there's a custom outlet st uh, structure here. And this is going to refer to the same terminology that follows. So here's their uh, schedule of what they're going to be checking. And then here's the excerpts. So here's their hydrodynamic separator. Tells you right here what the model number is, the Barracuda S6. This is what it looks like. Here's the instructions that they copied and pasted out of the Barracuda uh, proprietary manufacturer's information. Here's some excerpts from the underground stuff. Um, this language here, they worked out with the manufacturer, so ADS, who is the main manufacturer of all these. They're familiar with these. Um, oh, I was going to add this right here. This is the language that states still requires going here. It's got an email address of where they need to send their annual notes that they've looked into this. 
And it says this paragraph here says that you can change it as long as you check with us and we're okay with it. Um, here's information from the ADS proprietary instructions. And here's the excerpt of the actual custom outlet. So if they were to say somehow have a piece of trash bypass or go in this grate and clog things up, they can find out what they got to do to get down in there and clear out their two and five eighths inch orifice there or the lower, this, that's their overflow. They have a smaller one down here in the sump. So that's actually the end of my presentation. And um, that was, uh, I enjoyed showing that to you. It's been some work to get there, um, but you can see um, that it's all working in the way we envisioned it. And now you have an idea of what's happening in the city of Toledo and how we're working with the Lucas County uh, recorder and auditor. So I'll turn it back.